Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, thank you very much for uh, coming to listen to this quite interesting modern topic, modern session, 14 principles of Woodrow Wilson. And uh, for those who didn't read the report, I just remind you that after World War I, Wilson presented these principles in uh, the States. He proposed how to reorganize the world after this big disaster, but he didn't succeed because he didn't get any support from his colleagues uh, from the U.S. Senate. Europe was quite spectacle about that and uh, in principle uh, these messages hasn't been realized and uh, in continuation World War II happened and uh, now the part of these principles are implemented and uh, we live on them and now it's very interesting how we in uh, projecting and designing new globalization which is inevitable in my point of view what will be the rules we're going to live with and what were the rules which uh, has been uh, presented by Wilson in his quite prospective and interesting report uh, at that time, which he uh, de developed not alone, but together with uh, the scholars of Versailles. My name is uh, Igor Jurgens. I'm going to moderate the session. I'm not going to torture you with any specific questions. We uh, just try to know what are the thoughts and insights from the best specialists in this regard. We should pay the tribute to the Academy and the Gaidar Forum. The people who are today in the panel on my left are, of course, extraordinary thinkers and uh, uh, very good specialists in the area of global management and governance. I'd like to add also that 14 Wilson principles, for those who uh, know about them, are principles of a uh, uh, good uh, winner. For those who lost World War I, was not the right story. Those who were the winners, they were generously provided sovereignty, uh, peace, uh, and uh, uh, from the very beginning it was for the generous conqueror. He was the patriot of uh, the United States and he didn't concede the fact that these principles would be beneficial first and foremost for the United States. Uh, the relapse which uh, uh, was planned by those who won in Europe uh, with big sacrifice, who wanted to uh, make a lesson for Russians and Germans and for the others, these relapse was uh, uh, gained the upper hand and uh, for the group of thinkers who gathered in Versailles and Keynes and Weber and Kessler were among them, they worked on the prevailing, the uh, cooperation uh, above the revanchism. And there were a lot of intellectual uh, proponents and opponents of, uh, of Wilson. For example, one quotation from Keynes, uh, a great economist, and his quotation is the following. Wilson puts racial and national differences above the economic and cultural ties and guarantees uh, borders to the peoples, but uh, some misfortune. It's quite a strong uh, message uh, uh, saying that if you consider the globalism only from the point of view of sovereignty and independence and peaceful life, you can't see the further universalization and globalization. In this ca uh, regard, Keynes, who happened to become the founder of the International um, Monetary Fund and Bretton Woods system, he uh, from the modern point of view was right. But from the conservative point of view, I'm not going to analyze that. You know that both Congress and Senate of the United States, uh, they rejected, uh, the Le and League of Nations rejected it, and the isolationism within, uh, in the period of time of 20 years was a prevailing idea in the United States, and only Pearl Harbor and uh, the intrusion of Japanese uh, changed the situation. Today we have a lot of topics to discuss. He was uh, in uh, some points quite um, quite insightful. We should uh, 
improve some ideas. And once again, I'd like to tell you that we have best people here gathered to tell us how to do it. I'm going to introduce to you the speakers in uh, 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 in, in order of uh, their speeches. First, I'd like to ask Mr. Andrei Kartunov, who uh, worked a lot on this report, uh, the general director of uh, the Russian uh, Council on International Rela Foreign Relations. Please, uh, uh, Andrei, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jurgens. I'd like to say a few words about our project. I hope you have you had an opportunity to get acquainted with these texts. Uh, and I'd like to start with two reservations. One of uh, which is in, on substance and the other one is on the methodology. Of course, for us, Woodrow Wilson is the father of uh, the liberal ideas and liberal work order. From the historical point of view, it's not quite correct because the sources of uh, these ideas, of isolationist ideas, could be found in uh, works of European authors, in proposals of European politicians, not on from the 20th but also 19th century. We can go deeper into the history and it would be right to state that the sources of such approach to global policy lies in the European Enlightenment in the 18th century. However, the uh, uh, merit of Wilson is that he managed to transform this idea into practical proposals on uh, uh, the changing the world order. And uh, Wilson was the first and the only one American president who had a PhD uh, degree. I'm afraid that in the nearest future we will not uh, see such president in Washington. And the second reservation is that the authors who gathered and uh, prepared these materials were quite tendentious and uh, biased. These people like the heritage of Woodrow Wilson and the, the uh, idea of the liberal world order. I believe that this is quite uh, justified because uh, the word liberal in our discourse is uh, uh, now quite emotionally negative uh, connotation. And in the global point of view, we should look at this uh, uh, notion from another standpoint. Since I don't have enough time, I will just limit myself with a few messages which we can then discuss in more detail. The most important issue concerning 14 points of Wilson and uh, uh, the liberal ideology in the global point of view is the following. Uh, how we understand the global world order. There are a lot of definitions, a lot of aspects of this uh, thing. Someone put on the first front, up front the role of international organizations. Others say about the refusal of use of power, of force, and uh, pay a lot of attention to the detail. Third, say about uh, international and legal aspects. Our basis was the following. There are a few fundamental features of this uh, idea, and I'd like to mention here three of them. First, of course, the openness. Liberal uh, order, as uh, it was seen by Wilson and as was by, seen by his uh, supporters, is a, an open system, a system which uh, uh, opposes to isolationism, protectionism, which is against the uh, breaking up the world into separate blocks and at the same time which is universal, which is overarching for the whole uh, global policy in all its components in different regions and in different functional dimensions. Openness is maybe the fundamental principle and it can be tracked down from Wilson. It can, is contained in 14 um, uh, 
uh, points and in the comments of uh, his supporters. Second is uh, that the global order from the point of view of uh, Woodrow Wilson, who was a lawyer and uh, had a legal practice in the beginning of his political career, is a regulatory and normative system. The liberal world order is the order which is based on the norms and regulations. Uh, there could be different uh, regulations that could be codified or informal. They could be contained in international treaties or in uh, the uh, charters of international organizations, but they have to be there. And in the perfect case, these norms should be universal. <clears throat> they should uh, be used both for winners and losers if we take the context of the World War One. For Wilson, it was very important and it was very important for all his followers. The third thing, which is not so obvious and explicit in uh, these 14 points, but nevertheless it's quite essential, is uh, the rationalism of the system. Wilson proceeded from the fact that the system of international relations can be rationalized, that the interests, the national interests are rational in the sense that they are some uh, common denominator of uh, uh, different group interests existing inside uh, specific countries. The state shouldn't uh, seek for a certain national mission. The exterior policy can not be a uh, uh, caprice of a uh, despot or some religious uh, revelation. This is a relativist approach to the formation of the policy and how it should be implemented. These are three main principles. If we take them as a basis, a lot of things which is being discussed today about in the sense of the liberal order does not relate to the essence of the problem. And let me, and in our paper, we uh, considered a lot of uh, mythological things related to the world order. I'd like to take into account only three of them. This order and uh, Wilsonism as is, is associated with Pax Americana. It means that there is American world and there is the liberal order. If the United States enter some uh, descending track and the world is becoming less American, together with the American hegemony, we lose liberal uh, order from international relations. This point of view should be strongly corrected, because the United States, uh, even during the whole 20th century, uh, did not uh, follow uh, the Wilson principles in all aspects. And we know that the openness and uh, legal basis of the world order and rationalism uh, were violated many times by Washington in specific cases. But we can state that, as a matter of fact, the liberal world system in modern conditions is supported not only and not only by the American policy taking into account specific transformations of uh, uh, this policy in the form of uh, Donald Trump's administration. We cannot consider Donald Trump as the follower of Donald Wilson, although the main message of uh, the election campaign of Mr. Trump, America first, is of course the message of Wilson. This is the message of uh, Wilson's campaign of uh, 1916, when Wilson wanted to keep uh, 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 United States safe from the World War One, But today the liberal order is less connected to the American hegemony as uh, 30 or 50 years ago. The second and uh, familiar concept for us is that this Wilsonism, this liberal world order, is uh, strongly connected to the liberal ideology. And if the world enters some post-Western stage, in this regard, the world gets rid of uh, the Wilson's legacy. This uh, uh, message should be specified uh, at least, uh, because as the history of last decades showed, the uh, strongest 
beneficiaries of this order were not Western states. And this liberal world order uh, was very convenient for continental uh, social democratic Europe and uh, for authoritative Eastern Asia and uh, in some regards for technocratic monarchies of Persian Gulf. And why does it happen? Because in some sense, the principles uh, set up by Wilson uh, has a technical and not ideological character. We shouldn't state that the uh, world of uh, global gravitation is uh, Anglo-Saxon um, concept because it was provided by Newton. And we also shouldn't say that the liberal world order is a product and uh, also the belonging of only Anglo-Saxon world. It is much wider than the liberal political ideology and due to that fact it has become more uh, sustainable. And the final message that I wanted to produce to you about methodologies the idea that Wilsonism and uh, liberal world order is uh, some collusion of transnational elites is a message which requires a lot of precisions and specifications because the struggle is going on not between the elites and societies. It's going inside the elites and societies. What do, can we see on the example of the United States and what can we see on the example of the modern Europe? One more thing that we tried to um, uh, consider in our report and include in our papers, what are the alternatives to the Wilsonism in the modern world? Yes, we see uh, the uh, uh, defects and uh, outdatedness of uh, many messages, but uh, there is, and, and do we have an alternative to the ideas uh, produced 100 years ago? From my point of view, theoretically, we can uh, mention here three alternatives. The alternative of uh, global uh, power balances, the alternative of a new universal ideology, and there is an alternative of uh, the decay of uh, the um, global system, rationalization of the modern world, which we denominate in uh, with the message world war of all against all or uh, game without rules. How viable are those alternatives? We've been uh, speaking about the multipolar world for 20 years, but we uh, we don't see it happen. And why? Because the participants are very different and uh, they have very complicated relations and uh, the interdependence level is very high. And maybe in this regard, Wilson, who uh, spoke not about the balance of powers, but about the balance of the international core and periphery, is more uh, relevant now uh, versus Metternich, who uh, spoke about the concert in Europe in the beginning of 19th century. If we take into account the universal ideology, what kind of ideology could be there? Only a radical Islam or global caliphate. I'm, I, I, I don't think that we can accept that the uh, concept of the global caliphate is more acceptable than Wilson's ideas. And uh, uh, finally, atomization and uh, deterioration and the decay of uh, the global system. Of course, in some re cases, in some regards, uh, this process can happen, but it, had, it has its limitations. If the organization that the global system uh, implies interaction between the states and countries, if the level of interdependence will only grow, we only come back to the ideas and points which has been produced by Wilson 100 years ago. And the last point, I see that I don't have enough time now. I'd like to say only a few words about the challenges to the Wilson's ideas, uh, which we, how we see them now in the second decade of uh, the 21st century. Of course, now Wilsonism is in the deep defense. Of course, it is now under fierce criticism. Of course, 
many pillars, many messages of not only Wilson but uh, of 20, 30 years ago uh, has to be have to be verified, seriously verified. Of course, from the beginning, we need to reevaluate the global regulation in the global world, taking into account the fact that today it's very hard to get uh, a legal uh, uh, arrangement of uh, big international agreements. And uh, most probably in future, uh, the bigger role will be played by uh, voluntary agreements without uh, any official arrangement and not supported by uh, international treaties and not ratified by global parliaments. Secondly, it is that something that Wilson could not foresee, nor Roosevelt could foresee that when he was working on the Charter of the UN. The role of non-governmental actors in foreign policy. It was a truly new dimension of the liberal world order, which has not yet been presented fully enough. And it was not duly structured in terms of a proposal. And finally, the final point that I wanted to highlight is that if we compare Wilson's picture of the world, and if we take it simplistically and uh, compare it to the present situation, I would say that for Wilson, the world was a sort of a sort of uh, cubes or modules that could be used to build a simple structure. However, today, the world is rather a Lego set, kit, which uh, has much more elements and they give us an opportunity to produce much more options of a world order. So the task that we see in front of us today is much more complicated than that produced by Woodrow Wilson. It is a, a very good basis for us to think about how we can update and modernize the ideas that are still relevant even today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. I would like to thank uh, the whole team that worked on this report. It is of uh, extreme interest. I think uh, we will give the audience to ask uh, questions of Andre after other speakers give us their presentations. However, before giving the floor to the next speaker, I would like to just shortly comment uh, one thing that I, where I disagree with Andre. Right, on one hand, we, uh, well, attack uh, Wilson's principles. Universalism uh, is a, an obstacle to many of us. However, at the same time, this is one of the bases for the development of our world. At the same time, we see that pro-Wilson activists or thinkers um, are active right now. And you can refer to activists, come on, the destruction of population. The Roman club presented a book for, of 200 pages, the uh, foreign head of uh, the German Federal Republic. Uh, he was head of this team. They addressed the problems that cannot be solved uh, within national borders. Um, the name of the book is Come On. Right now, I would like to give the floor to the person very well known to you, and I think that uh, this person is one of the strongest and outstanding um, experts on politology, Ivan Krostis. He is a, a political scientist. He is a, a, a professor to the Vienna University uh, in political science. Um, and however, before giving him the floor, I would like to ask one question of him. Invi Ivan, you wrote a lot about the state of liberal democracy, specifically in our countries, the countries of uh, Western and Central Europe. And there you 
spoke upon about one thing that was touched upon, Andre. You said liberal democracy outgrew globalism, and uh, globalism has now accepted autocratic states. China, for example, is an autocratic state, and uh, they are part to globalism, and a big part of it, actually. So this aspect that uh, you presented broadly in your works, uh, could you please dwell upon this concept? Ivan, over to you. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, in what uh, Andre and his colleagues did. For three simple reasons that I'm going to touch on the question that you asked. First, now there is a lot of talk about international order. There is a lot of noise also, so people will just, but there is also talk, but it is always a discussion of what happened or not happened after the end of the Cold War, basically the lack of the new institutional design, or people go back to 1945, the end of the World War II. I find that going back to the Wilson makes a lot of sense for a very simple reason, and this is my first argument. This is the first time to try to construct an international order, keeping in mind that you have a state based on popular sovereignty. Uh, I know that the idea of the Vienna Congress is a very popular in Russia, but it is much easier to agree in Vienna when you have several emperors who like to go to the balls. Uh, but in a political system, where the public opinion starts to play a very strong role and the idea of legitimacy is different. I do believe that Wilson was the first to try to ask the question how you can have an international order, and I agree with Andre. For him, in liberal international order is the rule of state on global level. And of course, the problem is who is the enforcer? <laughs> who is the enforcer? Uh, but in order to present you where I see the problem, I'm going to start with two things that make a very strong impression on me recently. I'm just coming back from Turkey, an interesting state. And uh, I was talking to somebody, and the Turkish minister told me something that I found absolutely eye-opening. He told me, Ivan, you should understand, the World War II is over. We can discuss when it ended, in 1945 and in 1989, but the World War I is not over yet. So the process that started with the disintegration of the imperial continental empires, from his perspective, is not finished. And this is an interesting question, because if you start to look at 1999, 1919, 1945, 1989, you're going to see us three different ways to regulate all this. In 1919, the idea was the empires do not, cannot exist and cannot survive in the time of a popular sovereignty. So the idea was how to create a new legitimate states, and the idea of the nation states come, and basically you have the birth of the nation states all over Europe. Most of the, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, all the states were the result of it. After World War II, the idea was not so much about where the borders are. The problem was how to create a socially cohesive states that can have an internal legitimacy. So there was some correction of the borders, but the most important was the expulsion of the populations. You have an ethnic cleansing after the World War II, which was extremely strong in certain parts of Europe. For example, just to give you an example, in 1939, one third of population of Poland have been non-Poles. There were Germans, there were Ukrainians, there were Jews. After the end of the World War II, 95% of the population of Poland have been Poles. So, and this was on the Balkans, it happens to all of us. So in a certain way, ethnic homogeneity became one of the major sources of the legitimacy because the popular sovereignty was very much redefined in a kind of an ethnic terms. From this point of view, 1989 was extremely interesting because it tried to frame the question differently. And the question was, we try not to change the borders unless basically this cannot be avoided. We are not going to force people to move beyond the borders. We are going to change the nature of the borders. They should be the borders that are very easy to cross. I mean, for people, for ideas, and so on. Why I'm saying this? Because I do believe what we see today is a crisis that has two important dimensions. All this idea of a liberal order after the end of the Cold War was based on a positive understanding of interdependence interdependence as a major source of security. Uh, foreign policy magazine used to have the index of globalization and basically was ranking the countries and it starts from trade, cross-border trade to cross-border telephone conversations they were trying to indicators. 
What I do believe changed now, and this is a profound change because is that the things that yesterday were perceived as beneficial and producing security, interdependence, started to be perceived as the major source of insecurity. Everybody starts to push for asymmetrical interdependence. I want you to be more dependent on me than I'm going to be dependent on you. Otherwise, basically, I start to feel insecure. This is the very same thing that yesterday was perceived as a source of security, now is perceived as a source of insecurity. And I'm saying this because I do believe this is the major story, not that so much things changed in the way basically, okay, trade has been declined after the financial crisis, not in a such a gross stories. And then the problem of the borders came again. But now we're talking about different borders. For example, one of the critical borders that is now discussed is information borders. All the talk about cybersecurity is about the nature of the information borders. And by the way, this is going to become much more radical uh, when the translation machines are going in five or ten years, basically, to make this process even much easier. I do believe even the fact that you have such a rise of conspiracy theories all over the world on the national level, because you have almost state-sponsored conspiracy theories, is the way to create an information borders in the world in which it's so difficult, basically, to protect the information sovereignty. The second thing that makes a strong impression on me, and this comes to uh, basically why I do believe going back to Wilson and what Andre and his colleagues did is really very interesting, is the following. Imagine for the moment that Russian Revolution was not going to happen. When Wilson basically was coming with his uh, plan and the idea of liberal order, he didn't know very much what is going to be the nature of the Soviet state. Nobody had an idea. It's not about being good or bad, but it was totally unknown. Uh, why I'm saying this is interesting? Because then, it's not going to be the Cold War, it's going to be the decolonization that was going to be the major story. And I'm saying this because I had a very strong kind of intellectual shock. Some two or three years ago, I was reading the book uh, by an Indian historian who lives in London, Pankrai Mishra, called on the, on the Ruins of the Empire. And he was telling the intellectual trajectories of some of the most important figures, leaders of the national liberation movements of the 20th century, people like Ataturk, but uh, Sun Yat-sen and others. Do you know for them what was the most important war in the 20th century? Russian-Japanese War of 1905. All of them, I mean, all of them claimed that this was the most important war because for the first time, non-European state has been defeating, defeating a white empire. So for them, this was the most inspirational moment. And for example, for me, it was just uh, uh, extremely interesting to understand to what extent people uh, like Ataturk was fascinated with Japan. By the way, this was also true for the uh, national liberation movements even in Europe. Pilsudski, fascinated with Japan. Why I'm saying this? Because one of the problem of the, and this is particularly Russian problem and Western problem, of viewing the world is, we still can insist that in order to understand the world, our major reference should be the Cold War. But the Cold War is not the major reference from almost anybody else. For them, the Cold War was very much freezing the process of decolonization and the emergence of the states based on popular sovereignty that started with uh, first the disintegration of the continental empires and then basically the, the disintegration of, uh, uh, of the overseas empires of France, Britain and others. Uh, and here I go to, my, uh, 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 to, to my, last, my last point. One of the people working with Wilson when he was uh, trying to come this international order, of course, was Walter Lippmann. And Lippmann, after the end of the, uh, uh, of the World War II, came with two important problems that he sees in the way democracies do foreign policy. He said there are two basic problems with international order which is dominated by democracies. And when I mean democracy, keep in mind that even most of the authoritarian regimes that you have today are not a political regime that can ignore public opinion. Public opinion is a major force in a foreign policy decision making, even in a countries where the elections are not as competitive and open as uh, in other places. So he said the problem with the democracy as a player in the international order is first, that democracies are very bad at preparing for war. 
It's very difficult, basically, to push people to increase their military budget. So from this point of view, the governments should play very special games. But secondly, what is more important for our conversation is that democracies are very bad at signing constructive and long-lasting peace treaties. Because when the war started, in order to mobilize your population, you should try to totally criminalize the other side. Democracies are very bad at having a partial wars. The wars that have been so typical for 17th, 18th century cannot be there. In order to convince people to fight, you should tell them that the other side is the absolute evil. But if the other side is an absolute evil, how are you going to have a peace which is going to be kind of constructive uh, and which is going to last? And I do believe this is, uh, for me, this is a very interesting story. And I want to end on this. Also, every change of the international order is not only defined by the principles on which it is based, but also on the major type of a weapon in which the threat is perceived. You cannot imagine the Cold War all order without basically the existence of the nuclear uh, weapon. It was very much the disciplining nature of the atomic bomb that made the Cold War a peace, in a way. The interesting story is, from this point of view, and I'm going to finish on this, in order to imagine what is the real challenge, in my view, for the liberal order, we should understand that a certain way the cyber weapon has replaced the nuclear weapon is a very important one. And in a strange way, the cyber weapon is just the opposite to the nuclear weapon. Just give you four things. Nuclear weapon was possessed by very few states. Very few states. Secondly, you have a nuclear weapon not to use it because it is based on a total destruction. It was then almost impossible to imagine a non-state actor to possess it. <coughs> and thirdly, there is no deniability. If the atomic bomb is coming to you, everybody knows from where it comes. So you also know what to do. Go now with a cyber. First, this is not destructive, it's disruptive. So from this point of view, this is a weapon that is, you have it in order to use it. And you can use it many times. Secondly, non-state actors easily can have it. Thirdly, you have a high level of deniability. You never really know who did it. You can suspect probably 95% probability, but you really never know who did it. So from this point of view, the risk of basically responding wrongly is very high. And from this point of view, the level of regulation is a totally different one. And this is why I do believe that having a liberal order in which disruption and not destruction is the major threat is the biggest problem that we see beyond kind of ideology of one or another American, Chinese, or Russian leader. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Ivan. You, you, you made a bridge to, to my question, but you didn't answer my question. How yes. liberal democracies and the totalitarian dash authoritarian states will live together. No, but yeah. I, 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 I will leave you, no, no, I will leave you to think about it. Right, uh, just one thing. First of all, the problem is what is not possible now is to have a major state, nevertheless of the nature of its regime, which is totally isolated. <laughs> and don't forget that to a great extent, the classical, autocratic states that we talk about have been very much isolation states. Now it's very difficult to be done. Secondly, I do believe what is also changing very much the nature of authoritarian states is very much the existence of a big data as a source of information. So from this point of view, if 10 years ago people were convinced that the new technologies are the natural ally of democracy, even there was a term liberation technologies, this is very much questioned these days, because some of these new technologies are also becoming a very much instruments for any governments that want you to have a total social control. So from this point of view, the biggest problem now is that you don't know who is benefiting most from the technological developments. Democracies, and I mean the citizens of democracies, on one level they do, or are governments that are interested in a total control. And from this point of view, this is incredibly interesting. Keep in mind, big data, allows authoritarian governments to have something that they never had before, a relevant information about the state of their society. The biggest problem with the authoritarian governments was that they relied on the police information because they didn't allow political competition. And the police has the tendency to distort information for institutional reasons. With the big data, because of the nature of your connecting big data, you know about your society more than the authoritarian governments used to know before. 
that's better. That's almost sucker of the convergence of capitalism and socialism. Almost. Through the big data. Good idea. Thank you very much, Ivan. And, uh, if not, Marx was alive, he was going yeah. to ask for the nationalization of data, not for the nationalization yeah. of industries. Okay. Uh, now, the floor goes to Richard Haas. He doesn't need uh, uh, a lot of introduction. He is the chairman of the uh, Foreign uh, Relations Council, Council on Foreign Relations of the United States of America. He worked in the State Department, Department of Defense, in National Security Council, in IMF. He worked almost everywhere uh, in the United States and, and abroad. So, uh, and Richard Haas is a thinker who, uh, within Council for Foreign Relations and so-called Council of Councils, which unites 27, 28 think tanks of the world, they think about this global governance uh, and they think profoundly, they, they think productively from my personal point of view. So before giving him the floor, I would ask him one question uh, which derives from his recent book, A World in This Array, which is out now in, in, the, book, in, in the bookstores. You, Richard, argue that in the last 25 years the world has dramatically changed and the uh, rules, old rules, are not sufficient anymore to, to maintain international order. And you advocate World Order II, uh, which is not only sovereignty but a sovereign obligation. If you could dwell on that, among other things, we would be very helpful. We are thankful to you. The floor is yours, Richard. Well, th thank you, Igor, and it's, thank you all for being here. Those are two interesting acts to follow, lots to uh, chew on. It's also very interesting for an American to come here. I haven't heard so much spoken about Woodrow Wilson uh, in a long time. Uh, usually when he's spoken about in the United States, it's, it's somewhat differently about a Wilsonian tradition in opposition to realism, but uh, essentially a, uh, a hopes for uh, individual uh, freedom and choice, a foreign policy that focuses more on what goes on inside countries rather than between them. So it's interesting to return on the 100th anniversary of the, uh, of the 14 points. Uh, I find it a, a limited or inadequate foundation for the conversation, I'll be honest. At least half the points have been uh, historically uh, overtaken because they deal with territorial adjustments after World War I. The first point I simply disagree with. I do not believe in the principle of open and covenants, open covenants openly arrived at. That sounds like diplomacy in the age of Twitter. Uh, I actually prefer uh, covenants that are privately arrived at. It's tough enough that way than it is to try to do it in the age of social media. <clears throat> I do think there's still a strong case for freedom of navigation, for, for trade, and for reducing uh, armaments. Uh, I think there's also a role for an international body, but it, it can't play this, the dominant role that uh, Wilson foresaw for the League of Nations. It's, there's simply... There isn't, the word international community is used all the time, but the, uh, the cold truth, there, there, there isn't one. So no organization can be more effective than the degree of consensus that exists. Otherwise, we put too much hope in, in, in uh, organizations. Uh, secondly, uh, Andrei Kortunov talked about three futures, uh, a global balance of power, uh, some kind of a universalism and a world of decline or, or decay. Uh, I think we're seeing much more the third. We're seeing it because of uh, the rise of many, uh, a rise of certain powers, a redistribution of power, the rise of important non-state actors. We're seeing it that the many of the arrangements, the institutions that were born right after World War II are no longer adequate. Uh, as I said, there's a, an increasing absence of international community, of, of consensus. We're seeing uncharacteristic restraint by the United States. The United States 
was in many ways the pillar of the post-World War II, post-Cold War order, but I would argue beginning with Barack Obama and then accelerated by Donald Trump, we're seeing the United States to some degree pull back from that uh, traditional role. And last of all, we're seeing the rise of globalization. The world of 2018 is very different than the world of uh, 1918. And the degree of globalization has, in many cases, I believe, overwhelmed the ability of governments to manage security. And going back to something Ivan was talking about, certain borders states can close. States can close if they wish, with, at a price, their borders to trade. They can close their borders to some extent to immigrants or to refugees. It gets harder when it is to close your borders to information and it gets virtually impossible when it comes, say, to close your borders to greenhouse gases and climate change or f with uh, viruses like Ebola or Zika or, or influenza. So it's a, it's a much more complicated world in many ways, and particularly since we also have a population that's roughly eight times what Mr. Wilson had to uh, contend with. So let me add a fourth possibility in addition to a world of simply balance of power, uh, a world of universalism, and a world of decay, and this will give my answer to Igor, I think there needs to be a fourth option. And that essentially is a slightly different operating system for the world. And my, my argument is that the world now for 400 years has worked on an operating system that I call 1.0. And this is the operating system that grew up in the, after the wars in Europe in the 17th century. You had the Westphalian Agreement, and then over the, the decades and centuries to come, the, the, the basis of world order became respect for sovereignty. It was a world of, of nation states, and it was a respect for sovereignty. Wilson was sort of a sideshow in that, because what he was concerned about was the emergence of people who were colonies to become nation states. But he didn't challenge the basic architecture of the world. He simply wanted more people to participate in it. So it wasn't an alternative world order. His was simply opening up the existing world order to more people and more nation states. That was, that was Wilson's uh, particular contribution. I think this idea of World Order 1.0, of respect for sovereignty, was, was good. The problem is that often it wasn't respected. And uh, one of the lessons of history is you, history isn't simply based on ideas, it's also based on power. And you need the two. You need a, a set of ideas that are widely accepted, but you also need a balance of power to uphold it and to defend it. And my, the first half of the 20th century was a violent century where you had an absence of a balance of power and you had ideas that were not shared. And the second half of this 20th century was far more, far more orderly because there you did have a balance of power. And I think the question going forward is what will provide the, the mechanism uh, and the basis for order in this, in this different era, which we're now approximately 25, 30 years uh, into. And my argument, and this is Igor's question, is world order 2.0 is we need a new operating system. And just to be clear, it doesn't replace the previous uh, operating system based on sovereignty, it adds to it. We still need a world in which sovereignty is respected. If not, we have the problem of Saddam Hussein invading Kuwait, and uh, with all due respect to my hosts, we have the problem of what Russia did in Crimea and continues to do in eastern Ukraine. And a world in which sovereignty is not respected is a world of, of violence. And this to me is a dangerous world. But it is not enough. And my argument is that we now need to think about activities that go on inside countries, inside their territory, inside their borders, that pose risks and threats to others. If we have terrorists, as we saw on 9-11, operating out of Afghanistan, we can't respect Afghanistan sovereignty and ignore those terrorists. If we have computer hackers operating out of the territory of a country, we can't say it's that country's sovereign right to protect those computer hackers if those hackers can undermine our security 
or our economy. If a country follows terrible health practices and viruses come out, those viruses will infect everyone. We can't ignore that. If countries burn fossil fuels in great amounts, irresponsibly, they will contribute to climate change. Climate change reflects no border. And I could go on and on. So my point is simply, we now have to have an approach to the world that respects sovereignty, but at the same time, we can't simply think of sovereignty as a, a basket of rights, of protections. Yes, it is a basket of rights and protections, not absolute. We have things like the Genocide Convention. We have the concept of responsibility to protect. But my point is rather a different one, that we have to think now of sovereignty also as obligations. We need governments to accept the fact that they have the obligation to police their own territory so that things do not take place within their own territory that could adversely affect the security and welfare and prosperity of others because of globalization. Why should they do it? Because it's good for them as well. They have a stake that others police what goes on inside their territory so it does not come back across their borders and hurt them. And my argument is that if the 21st century is ultimately going to be a successful century, we need to embrace the original idea of sovereignty, World Order 1.0, but now we need to add to it. We need to come up with, with, with efficient, effective mechanisms for dealing with the, the challenges posed by globalization and the fact that in many cases borders are permeable, they are open, and, we, and governments and countries will be overwhelmed uh, if they do not begin to take uh, responsibility or accept the obligation of controlling those things which could come from their territory and hurt others. And this, to me, ought to be a principal dimension of diplomacy for the 21st uh, century. So we need to have, if you will, traditional diplomacy to deal with the familiar problems posed by violations or threats to sovereignty, if you will, World Order 1.0. But again, if we are going to have a successful century, we now need to also come up with a diplomacy that addresses the challenge this, that I would argue are at the heart of World Order 2.0. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, my question fully answered. I am, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that there will be many more questions coming your way when we have Q&A uh, session. Uh, and now we we'll logically come to the economic global governance. And uh, we have uh, one of the best speakers to, to tell us about this, Zia Qureshi, who was uh, chief economist of the World Bank, uh, who was senior vice president of the World Bank. Before that, he worked in, in the International Monetary Fund. So he worked in all those global organizations created after the Second World War as the, as the first steps to create global economic governance. And my question to you, Zia, among other things, would be uh, you participated definitely in the creation of Z2, uh, G20 one way or another. This is another instrument of economic global governance which was created after the financial crisis and through creation of FSB and other instruments tackled the most acute crisis after the Great Depression in a manner which some of us even didn't notice that there was a world crisis. A lot of talk and a lot of meltdown in financial systems and stuff like that, but uh, you, you cannot compare what happened in 2007, 2008 to what happened uh, after the Great Depression. Uh, the, the floor is yours, Zia, and uh, we, we are very attentive to you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the uh, uh, invitation to uh, get our forum and uh, uh, my congratulations to Mr. Kotunov and the team on a very thoughtful uh, book. <laughs> I very much enjoyed uh, reading it and uh, learned a lot from it. So uh, congratulations uh, on that. Uh, uh, given uh, what uh, has been said already, and uh, being a, an economist, uh, I would uh, uh, 
uh, try to uh, bring uh, more of an economic perspective to the discussion, and it also relates to the uh, question uh, that you have asked uh, me specifically, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. Um, uh, so I will, in my first set of uh, remarks, make uh, uh, three points. Uh, uh, first is to bring out the importance of policies at the national level. Often in the debate on globalization, uh, national policies do not get the attention they warrant. But their role is fundamental. So ironically, actually, in this, uh, uh, if there's a crisis of globalization, the main area for action, I mean, there is an agenda at the international level, of course, and I'll come to that as my second point. But the main area of action is in terms of national policy responses. We have seen uh, a, backlash, a backlash develop against globalization, rise of uh, economic nationalism, uh, protectionism, and uh, for the most part, uh, the problem is not globalization per se, even though, as I said, there are issues of international policy reform, and I'll, I'll get to that. But in large part, the problem is lack of adequate national policy reform. Uh, I mean, this relates uh, to uh, uh, Richard Haas's uh, book, uh, The World in Disarray. Yes, there is a disarray in the world uh, that we see. But in large part, this reflects disarray or dysfunction in national policies, in national policy responses to the challenges that uh, come uh, from uh, globalization. Uh, major reason for this backlash uh, and the biggest uh, policy letdown has been the failure of national policies to address the rise in inequality. Uh, inequality has risen in uh, most countries, uh, especially in advanced economies. And sharply in some of them, in particular the United States. Uh, since the 1980s, the, the share of top 1% in national income has more than doubled to 22%. Its 1% uh, top 1% share in wealth has uh, increased to 40%. And uh, according to latest numbers, the three people in the United States own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the population, that is 160 million people. So sharp increases in equality and policy response uh, has been uh, lacking. Trade, globalization trade, uh, has been an engine of economic prosperity. It increases aggregate welfare. But it, 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 it can uh, 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 increase inequality, and it has, alongside other factors, contributed to the increase in inequality that, that we see. It creates winners and losers. Uh, but but there hasn't been an adequate uh, response, policy response, to these distributional impacts uh, of, of trade. Uh, the free traders, including economists, I'm an economist, they have been sort of cheerleading uh, free trade, uh, minimizing these distributional impacts. Uh, the uh, the anti-traders or protectionists have been bashing free trade. A more productive, fruitful focus would be a debate on policy responses to deal with these uh, distributional impacts. Uh, trade liberalization requires that it is complemented with national policies that allow workers and businesses to uh, share broadly in the opportunities that come from trade. Uh, they are helped in a in adjusting to the, uh, the change environment. So this means uh, policies to uh, uh, ensure there is competition in markets, there is level playing field, there is upskilling, reskilling of workers, uh, there is social protection to help them uh, ad uh, adjust and, and move to uh, new opportunities. And also, yes, there is a role for uh, fiscal uh, redistribution. Uh, and similar uh, issues arise with respect to another major force, uh, and that is that is technology. I mean, technology uh, uh, is a is a big driver of uh, increase in productivity, growth, prosperity. But it also creates out outcomes which, which which are unequal, and it, and it, it 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 raises the same kinds of uh, policy issues that I I, I mentioned with respect to trade, uh, the technology, uh, digital technologies 
labor-saving uh, skill uh, bias technology. So it requires the, uh, uh, the same kinds of policy responses to ensure that there is broad sharing of the uh, uh, opportunities and benefits. Uh, in, in, in most of these areas, policy action has been solely lacking, has been solely inadequate uh, in, in most countries. So rather than bemoan or scapegoat globalization, Countries need to put their national policy houses in order. Unless most people see benefit from globalization, globalization will not be sustainable. And there is a crucial role there for, uh, for national policies. Increased economic integration requires that international and national policies work better uh, in, in, in concert. So I would say that rather than this hand-wringing about globalization, uh, there should be more focus on this kind of policy debate. Sometimes in discussions of foreign policy, you hear uh, this expression, uh, uh, foreign policy begins at home. It applies to trade. Uh, you, you've said that. I wrote a book with that. Right. Uh, trade policy begins at home. Uh, so that's my first point, that we need to, we need to uh, recognize the fundamentally important role of national policies. Second, uh, the agenda at the international level. Yes, uh, there is a reform agenda there. Uh, there uh, there's need for rules that ensure that when countries engage internationally in trade, in uh, investment, in the flow of skills, technologies, that, uh, uh, that the rules are fair, there is a level playing field, uh, it's, a, it's an effective uh, rules-based system. And here uh, uh, I'm reminded of the work that uh, John Ruggie, a Harvard professor of international affairs, did uh, some years ago about embedding of global markets. For markets within national economies to work well, you need institutions. I mean, in labor markets, uh, financial markets, product markets, you, you have regulatory institutions to make them function well. Uh, similarly, at the global level, there is need for institutions to, uh, to, to embed global markets in, in, in global uh, institutions. And there, there has been a deficit, a uh, globalization deficit. Global institutions have not kept pace with the advances in economic integration, uh, with technological change, with structural transformations in, 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 in the global economy. Uh, and uh, an example of that, uh, increasingly in the world, uh, issues relating to trade, investment, uh, competition, intellectual property rights are, are intertwined. Uh, but in the current institutional framework at the global level, uh, we don't have a system to deal with that in a holistic way, in a coordinated way. The WTA mandate is uh, largely related to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to trade. Uh, issues of digital trade. Digital trade is now the most dynamic component of international flows. Uh, in fact, uh, digital trade now has a larger impact on global economic growth than traditional trade uh, in goods. But the, uh, but the interna international institutional framework for digital trade is uh, still, uh, the development of that is uh, uh, still in its infancy. The issues relating uh, to cyber uh, space were mentioned. So, so, so there is this inadequate institutional development at the institutional level which weakens confidence, faith in these international institutions and which, uh, which reinforce policy failures at the national level to produce unequal, inequitable outcomes uh, at the global level, on a global scale. For instance, uh, failure of competition policies uh, uh, has uh, uh, led to increased inequalities within countries, uh, increased industrial concentration. In the US, industrial concentration has increased practically in all sectors. But uh, there has also been a rise in, in, in global monopolies, uh, uh, increase in uh, cross-border mergers and, and acquisitions. I mean, today, uh, just a number there, uh, eight uh, technology uh, giants, multinationals, uh, account for about a third of the market capitalization of the world's top 100 uh, companies. Uh, 
and, and, and the new technologies create these uh, winner-take-all outcomes, uh, but the policy frameworks to deal uh, uh, with, with them, uh, they have uh, not uh, kept pace. Uh, similarly, with respect to intellectual property rights, in, uh, in today's world, uh, uh, knowledge economy, the intangible economy, uh, intellectual property rights uh, are, are uh, increasingly important. But uh, the, uh, the, the rules relating to patents, copyrights, uh, they have not evolved. Uh, in a recent uh, book by Lindsay and Tellus, uh, I, I, uh, I quote from that, that the, the current system of patents and copyrights is, uh, uh, is more a system of uh, intellectual monopoly rather than uh, intellectual property. So there is a lot of institutional development that is needed at the international level. And, and, and this connects with the point that uh, Richard uh, Haas was making about the uh, World Order 2.0, that uh, th there are these sovereign rights uh, which uh, with, uh, in large part define the, uh, what he uh, calls uh, World Order 1.0. But there are sovereign obligations, which is a key, a key point in World Order 2.0. So these uh, uh, sovereign obligations need to be embedded in global institutions, in, in a rules-based global framework. So my third point, last point, and I'll connect that to G20, that so there's a clear need to close this gap between what is needed in terms of the challenges of globalization and what is there in, uh, on the ground, the realities uh, in terms of the institution that is there. So there is this gap and it, 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 uh, it, it needs to be closed to the uh, development of global disciplines, institution. Politically, it is very difficult. Uh, the need is clear, but the political economy of that is complex, it is difficult. And it is even more daunting than in the current uh, political uh, uh, climate. Uh, it will require statesmanship, uh, pragmatism, and a, and a careful balancing of uh, conflicting, uh, uh, competing phenomena. And here, uh, I think it is useful to, uh, to uh, bring in uh, what uh, an economist, Denny Roderick, calls the, uh, the political trilemma of the world economy, which is the difficulty of reconciling national sovereignty, policy making that is based on democratic deliberation, and global in economic integration. The, uh, the difficulty of uh, achieving all these three, that is the uh, trilemma. And his trilemma leads to the uh, uh, globalization paradox, uh, that globalization boosts economic prosperity, but works best when it is not pushed too far for its own sake, but managed through international disciplines that ensure fair play, and complement it with preservation of adequate policy space at the national level to accommodate uh, diversity and uh, plurality of national objectives, approaches, preferences. And also, as I said earlier, uh, it is at the national level uh, that, uh, that you have the uh, main arena for, uh, for policy action. And, and, and there needs to be a, a larger role, and I think uh, uh, Richard made that point, uh, for plurilateral approaches, where uh, on most issues uh, today, uh, certainly uh, trade-related WTO-type issues, it is difficult at the outset to proceed in a fully multilateral way and seek unanimity. Uh, but where there is a coalition of the willing, uh, a plurilateral uh, process can, can start and others can, uh, can uh, catch up. And uh, recently, the, at the uh, WTO Ministerial in Buenos Aires, for instance, they set up a group of about 50 countries uh, to uh, start a process of discussion on some uh, future disciplines relating to digital trade, e-commerce. So, it, uh, And G20 uh, is also a forum that can play uh, a very important role uh, in this. Uh, 
Uh, it's kind of a, a plurilateral approach, about 20 uh, biggest economies, uh, and, uh, and they, have, uh, they have demonstrated that uh, they can be a, a useful positive uh, force uh, in, this, in this context. I mean, we have seen uh, that in the response to the global financial crisis. In the significant reform that has taken place uh, in the global uh, financial system in terms of strengthening regulations, uh, capital requirements, etc., is an ongoing agenda. But I think in the financial sphere, uh, G20 has considerable uh, achievement uh, that, uh, that it can point to. And uh, also uh, in, the, uh, in, in the area of uh, taxation, uh, the uh, shifting of profits to offshore havens, Working with the OECD, they have established disciplines to prevent uh, base erosion and profit shifting. So, so these are examples where frameworks such as G20 uh, plurilateral approaches can provide the political leadership, uh, can get things going in a, in a larger setting, which is politically uh, very difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, in fact, uh, the final speaker of our panel will be Dmitry Trenin, and he doesn't need a long introduction either. He's an outstanding Russian politician. He's the head of uh, Carnegie Moscow Center. He's the person who knows everything about the foreign pol policy of Russian Federation. So one of my questions to you, Dmitry, is as follows. Uh, we, Russian Federation, both in our words and in our actions, we support international regulation starting from the Security Council and uh, to the international contract system, but we criticize the liberal order up to the point uh, where we claim that it imposes, and I uh, understand uh, what uh, who is the actor of imposing uh, um, well, we see that Washington is imposing things and Brussels is imposing things, and uh, we oppose that. So the UN, the international law, uh, well, what prospects do you see in that regards? Thank you. Thank you very much, Igor. Well, I do not know how to respond to this undeserved uh, introduction, but thank you very much. I will answer a question and then I will comment on my report. To my mind, for Russian Federation, uh, we have a maxima which is uh, fully supported by those who rule the country and uh, those who rule the Russian foreign policy. Russia is nothing if it is not a great empire, uh, a great state. Uh, it is nothing if it is not recognized as a great state. In terms of uh, the Security Council, for Russia, the main value of the UN is in terms of its standing membership in the Council of uh, Security and uh, in the Security Council and the veto right uh, that uh, Russia can use. In my point of view, Russia is uh, not as much interested in a specific concept of world order. I think we are still in the process of understanding which concept is more acceptable to us. But it is important for us to understand our status and our place in the world order, our rights, and uh, the attitude of other countries to this place and these rights. This is a short answer to your question. Thank you very much. In fact, de Gaulle said that uh, France will either be a great um, c country or it will fall apart. France uh, is not a great power right now, but it still is uh, an important country. And um, as to the report, in fact, I would like to congratulate Andre. I think this is a very high quality work. It is a brilliant thesis. I think here we have uh, a lot of ideas that uh, must be considered that should uh, make it to intellectual discussions and they will also make it to the r development of Russian foreign policy that will correspond to the reality of the 21st century. I agree to many ideas. 
put, set out there. Uh, I disagree with some things, but I will not focus on neither of on either of those. I would rather speak about the context of this report. I think it is uh, underestimated in terms of our discussion. I think uh, it is uh, the concept which is stated there is uh, not a liberal one. It is rather uh, idealistic. I do not ignore important statements and messages of uh, Wilsonism, uh, those that relate to the international law, international trade, international cooperation. I think, speaking about the world order, it is important to mention and to consider realism here. Even the American foreign policy, the one we mentioned already, Wilsonism, is also is always competing and goes hand in hand with realism. And usually we take into consideration the results of both. I've just mentioned that uh, Wilsonism, in my point of view, is uh, an idealistic concept. But at the same time, I, I think I will just um, correct myself by saying that the aspects uh, that were there in the ideology of Wilsonism are implemented in the practice of uh, the EU and uh, in the ideology of EU and uh, sometimes it is not it does not even relate to the United States inside the European Union many ideas that we may call Wilson ideas that we may ad identify as Wilson's ideas they work they are implemented and this is a very important example for the whole humanity but it doesn't mean that they make a model for the whole humanity because the humanity is mu a much more complicated phenomena that uh, we see in the example of the European Union in Andre's report um, uh, it is called seven arguments of the 14 points and I have seven comments to that. The first comment being that the world order, well, you may call it banal or too simplistic, but sometimes we need to speak about th simple things. The world order reflects the distribution of forces, influence and will in the world and it is based on this distribution. The current world disorder is actually the process of transition from the order model which is based on the domination of one power the US over the last 20 years to the conceptually more com complicated model with uh, one leading player one candidate for playing the first violin that being China several big powers that uh, compete with the U uh, U.S., including Russia. Uh, there are regional powers like Turkey that act autonomously and uh, they uh, strive for dominance in their regions. And there are states of the third level and actually to my mind this is a revolution in the international strategic relations when we see a country of a uh, uh, thir of the third group, like uh, uh, the Korean Democratic R R Republic, uh, they threaten the U a country like the U.S. with a nuclear weapon. This is something which hasn't happened before, ever. Uh, there are a lot of other international players, and uh, here we have players that um, have uh, either economic or technological potential and uh, resources. These players uh, get a possibility to take part in the international, at the international level. Uh, and uh, before these possibilities and these opportunities were only available to big states. This is uh, the reality we live in. Pax Americana is lo no longer an expression. This is rather a description for a the period of uh, a time frame of international uh, relation from the Berlin Wall to uh, the Crimean issue. And uh, 
it has changed a lot the perception of uh, such countries as China, India, and post-Soviet countries, countries where liberal capitalism is now practiced. The end of Pax Americana is not only the result of uh, uh, the rise of competitors, countries like China, or all restrain on the side of the US, if these processes are in place. But the main driving force of this change is the development and of the international environment and uh, this environment's becoming more and more complicating, complicated. And this is what changes the world order. My third message is that uh, the world order cannot be invented or created by thinkers or philosophers, uh, even not even by thinkers that preside over one country. Uh, the world order is the result of compet competition and struggle, which is uh, rather simple as well. The historical change of the world order uh, before happened as a result of war, and uh, the winner actually one and single winner did not exist. The, wor the world order changes, but there is no one single winner. As, for example, a group of winners, as it happened after the Napoleon Wars and World War II, we don't have it in the history. As a result, we have principally different uh, relations where the powerful, the most powerful power will not dominate and the state will lose the monopoly for being only uh, one entity of international relations. A lot of uh, it, what is being said about post-world order, post-war order, post-Western order, but it, it can be post-Western but not anti-Western. It means only uh, discontinuation of monopoly, but not uh, going away of, West, of the West from the global arena and uh, not leaving them the very important positions which they have. My fourth observation is quite simple too. The global order shouldn't be mixed with the mechanisms and rules and norms. In other words, one thing is world order and the other thing is global governance. We shouldn't mix up these things. It's methodologically wrong, I think, but very often it's being done yet. And it's obvious that mechanisms of organization reflect the uh, power balance, the ideological traditions and uh, biases of uh, important players who dominate in this organization, but uh, UN doesn't have subjectivity as a matter of fact. In the same way as international financial institutions, uh, for the most part, are derivatives from other institutions, from uh, influence of uh, different states and the totality of different states. International organizations are either diplomatic uh, forums, uh, diplomatic platforms where global uh, agreement is reached or proxies of more powerful states. Next observation, different levels of global order which was mentioned by Andre, they have different uh, uh, level of succession. The economic order is more successive. As a matter of fact, it reflects the real state of the global economy and uh, is in line with this state. Basically, the whole world lives uh, in uh, the conditions of the global economic order and contradictions uh, relate very important uh, matters, but not fundamental things. Other uh, uh, thing is uh, geopolitical order. The perfect case would be if we project uh, the economic order on geopolicy, uh, the per perfect case would be the empire, the liberal empire. But the liberal global empire uh, does not exist. And uh, the West, headed by the state, expanded after the Cold War, and then they faced the resistance, the fourth wave of democratization faded away. Uh, autocratic regimes were quite resistant and sustainable, and uh, so on and so forth. Now I move to the political and ideological order, which I uh, 
described a little bit before. The problem of democracy deteriorates or is becoming more sophisticated. It's becoming a problem of management, problem of participation, and uh, many things which has, has which have been the virtues of democracy before are becoming its problems and challenges, uh, which was uh, partially mentioned by Ivan when he mentioned the uh, wheel of democracy the uh, and the manipulation of the public opinion. And this is becoming a problem, interpolitical problem, and sometimes international problem. Two last points from my side. What is ahead of us? On my opinion, for the whole perspective, the United States will uh, keep their supremacy in the West. I don't uh, see Europe as uh, an independent strategic player for the nearest future. It is an uh, independent economical player, of course, and a very important uh, geopolitical reality for all of us. But as for the strategic player, I don't think uh, Europe could become. The China, China will not be a successor of uh, the states. And uh, multipolar world, uh, according to the 19th century, uh, will not exist. Vienna Congress and all other world has become has become very complicated. As a result, I see complicated interaction of multiple uh, different uh, players of different levels. And uh, what is important, in my opinion, that the global world 2.0, which was mentioned by Mr. Haas, does not replace the uh, work order 1.2, but is uh, supplementing it. We are going to live both in uh, the work order 1.0 and in some regions, and in also in the world order 2.0. And as a result, we get quite complicated system of international relations. And the last point, Wilsonism is still valid. Not It is valid as a part of intellectual heritage and some kind of inspiration for the future. Uh, world order, but the perspectives of the world order will depend not uh, uh, on the intellectual forces and efforts, and uh, I would like to emphasize not Western players. I expect badly, I don't know whether my expectation will come true, I expect that our Chinese friends offer uh, some detailed elaboration on the ideas and slogans that has been proposed by Xi Jinping uh, about the global destiny of the humanity and many other things. But anyway, not Western intellectuals, but also Indian and Arabic intellectuals and Russian intellectuals should take part in this. The asymmetric competition between different groups, between states, and what is really important inside the states. And very important thing that I see in uh, the world of 21st century is qualitative Im improvement of competition. This is going to be a very competitive, competitive, highly competitive world. The management will be complicated. The order will be very complicated. But this is the task which uh, is in front of us we shouldn't ignore. Thank you very much. And now, after such powerful speeches and messages, you have the floor, you have uh, the opportunity to ask questions and uh, to specify from uh, our speakers something, and uh, just a second. Not, not like that. Please, hold on. Uh, to specify everything. First, the first hand was there, your last row, please. I'm pres president of the American Institute of Business and Economics in Moscow. Been in Russia for 25 years. Okay. Now, my question is addressed to Richard Haas and to Dmitry Trinin. Is the end of Pax Americana a result of the failure of American interventionism over the last 60 years, namely Vietnam, Iraq, Libya, uh, you could argue Syria, and maybe even Ukraine. Okay? 
All of these are failed interventions, uh, most recently based on neoconism. And I say this with a critical view in the tradition of a young congressman from Illinois in 1845 whose maiden speech was against the uh, Mexican-U.S. war. You have to guess who I'm talking about. So thank you. Richard. To a large extent, uh, I would disagree. I think the... Uh, if we first, I'll make a few points. One, I think it's too soon to speak about the end of Pax Americana. I think it's weaker than it was, but there are still important elements of it that persist, and there certainly is no alternative. Second of all, American uh, intervention in some cases, like Vietnam, uh, the decision to go north of the 38th parallel in Korea, the Iraq War of 2003, I would argue, were counterproductive. And they drained some resources and they raised questions amidst the American body politic about the uh, values of uh, internationalism. But large elements of American uh, foreign policy and commitment to the world survived all of those. So I, do, I don't see those as having, uh, quote unquote, ended Pax Americana. I'm actually more concerned by what the United States has chosen not to do than I am about what the United States is doing. I'm concerned about some of the restraint of the previous president. I'm even more concerned about the current president's uh, lack of commitment to important elements of what have created what you described as Pax Americana, whether it's the global trading system that Mr. Cresci knows so much uh, about our alliance structure, our support of multilateral uh, institutions and arrangements. But I also think it's important to take a step back and look at other things, and I think which have nothing necessarily to do with the United States, but it's the rise of a whole new host of phenomena decided with globalization. It's the uh, rise of all sorts of new actors with new capabilities, the distribution of capacity is a fundamental characterization of, uh, of this world. There's more capacity and more hands than in any other time in, in history. It's the uh, inability of existing institutions to keep pace with these, with these changes. So what, all I'm saying is I think there's any number of structural reasons that explain the fact that the uh, world is, uh, as I would say, in greater disarray and I think the American underreach is actually a far greater problem for the world and for, I'd say, for the United States than American overreach uh, has been. Dmitry. Well, I hope my answer will not sound as uh, uh, support for U.S. interventionism. But uh, I see... Um, uh, but whereas Richard uh, placed the emphasis on Americana, I would place the emphasis on Pax, which is peace. Um, I think that uh, U.S. Uh, dominance in the world, which is still there to a limit to a smaller degree than it used to be, but it's still there and will be there for a long time, is no longer uncontested. This country is uh, de facto at war with the United States today in uh, political, uh, economic, information, and cyberspheres. We've broken through all the barriers toward conflict with the United States of America, except for one. We're in a very dangerous spot right now, we and the United States, and I would say the entire world. Now, Pax Americana, wor worth the name, will continue for um, in my view, an uh, indefinite period of time within what I would call, uh, Richard once called it the American Empire, I would call it uh, the Anglo world and Europe. Within that large chunk of the world, Pax Americana is alive and well and will continue to exist. But globally, no, that's, that's the end of it. Mark Dombrowski, I have two questions. One is, the first one is to Ivan 
about the role of media in undermining the global economic and political order. What I mean is, in both traditional and new media, what I mean is increasingly national or even local focus in terms of information explaining reality, and then also increasing, I would say, national or even nationalistic narrative. I think that doesn't need further explanation. My second question is to Zia. Uh, you mentioned about the problem, inequality problem, especially in the US. I don't want to question that inequality has a big importance for every national politics. Um, but at the same time, globalization trade contributed to decreasing global inequality between citizens of the world. This, uh, I mean research of Branko Milanovic, of Jolt Darvas, or many, many other people. So perhaps we have certain trade-off that, that, that um, societies of the rich country perhaps uh, have to accept greater inequality in order to have less inequality uh, in the world, which I think is also very important politically, not only economically. If we, you know, if we have ideally very equal American society or very equal European society, but then we have enormous income gap with, with uh, the rest of the world, then I, I don't think that such uh, world will be uh, acceptable and safe. Ivan. Because it was touching also on some of the ideological changes, I just want to, to make one point which is quite important for me. And this is the following. Now people start to talk, and this is also connected with nationalism, a lot about the rise of identity politics, both on the level of domestic politics and international politics. But I do believe domestic politics, was, uh, in identity politics, was also very much there in the 1990s. What changed was that identity politics was the politics of the minorities. In a certain way, this was their right. And the key word was recognition. What was typical for the liberal order, as we know in the post-Cold War period, was that power was not something to be spoken about. This is like with the sex in Victorian Britain. You can practice it, but speaking about it is not a bon ton. So from this point of view, recognition, this is basically that we know that there were power asymmetries. For example, being a Bulgarian, I know that my country is slightly less influenced than both Russia and the United States. But in the international discourse, I should behave as if I don't notice this. What has changed? And this has changed on several places. It changed in Russia, it changed in China, it changed in the United States. The word and the idea of recognition was replaced by the idea of respect. Do you see that basically these days the big powers believe that they are not respected? Mr. Trump believes that the German budget surplus is disrespect for the United States. Russia believes that it is not respected. China believes that this is not respected. What does it mean? We mean that now people want to recognize the power asymmetry in their relations. This is like in the Russian prisons. You know to be a respected man in the Russian prisons. I know that you are stronger than me. And I do believe from this point of view, for the first time, this is why you have this kind of emergence between a kind of realist understanding of the world, which power is very much clear and you speak about it. Nevertheless, that you are not changing basically the institutions and uh, the general idea that others have certain rights too. And here comes the problem of the media. First of all, with media, three things happened. When we talk about sovereignty, one of the most important story about sovereignty is information sovereignty. And this is very much connected to the language. The government usually used to have a huge propaganda advantage in their own societies. And nationalism was very much based on this. Now in this global world, three things has happened. First, when you talk to somebody, you talk to everybody. This is particularly the social media. You never know basically where you, your information is going to go. Secondly, you can decide and stay in a certain information sphere and not to be interested at all what basically others, what kind of information they consume. 
if a classical nationalism was tribalism by origin, now this is tribalism by choice. Let's give you one American figure. At this moment, the number of the Republicans in the United States, and this is true also for the Democrats, who are not going to tolerate their son or daughter to marry a Democrat if you're a Republican, a Democrat marrying a Republican, is the same as between the Catholics and Protestants at the end of the 19th century. So from a certain point of view, you make a tribal choice to belong to something, and this type of your identity is very difficult to be challenged because you are not going to be exposed. You decided not to be exposed to any type of an alternative information. And I do believe as a result of it, the fact that you start to have a very strong sub-national identities because of the nature of the global media, because of the social media and others, the governments responded with a very strong nationalistic propaganda effort on a state level. This is the fight of the states to renationalize the information space. And this is why, if before, listen, there was always a lot of, uh, coming from where I'm coming from, the Balkans, we always had more conspiracy theory per capita than in most places in the world. But they have been quite diverse. What is new is that you can see that, and this is not one government or another government, in many parts of the world, conspiracy theories are replacing ideologies as the major state of identity. And this is exactly as a response to the fact that the information nature of the sovereignty of states have been very much challenged, and because the new big technology companies appear to be stronger than most of the states. Uh, and how to regulate it, it was interesting to see that basically there is something very common between China, Russia, and the United States today is basically the attempt to regulate the big technology companies. Uh, and uh, for different reasons, <laughs> I mean, for different reasons. So this is what I do believe has changed, and this is changing the nature of democracy. Democracy starts with the fact that you're living in a society in which you are sharing certain public space. You can disagree as much you are because of your values or interests, but you share a certain type of an information which is common to all of you. And we do not live in a world of a common information anymore. Uh, and I do believe this is also making it so difficult uh, uh, for some of, uh, for democracies, basically, to gain the level of the effectiveness that they had before. Sorry. Zia. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, it, it is correct that uh, over the past uh, few decades, uh, uh, during which we have seen inequality rise within countries, uh, inequality between countries has declined as growth has picked up in emerging economies uh, and uh, so the uh, per capita income gap uh, between them and advanced economies has narrowed, so global inequality has narrowed. But inequality within countries has increased and not only in advanced economies, it has increased in most emerging economies as, as well. It has increased in Russia, it has increased in China, it has increased in India. Right. Uh, so. Uh, so there is, uh, so there, so this is the picture, and and globalization has contributed to this. It has contributed to uh, growth in emerging economies, to global prosperity, to decline in inter-country uh, inequality, and it has contributed alongside other factors. Technology actually is a, is a bigger factor uh, to rise in inequality within countries. Uh, but as I was. Uh, saying uh, earlier, uh, there's a role for national policies to address uh, the rise in uh, within uh, uh, country inequality, uh, inequality. Those distributional outcomes of globalization are not preordained; they can be addressed. So this uh, this uh, it's a false narrative to to think of the interests of global poor as being a, uh, in uh, in conflict with the interest of lower and middle classes in advanced economies. Through so right policies, they can be reconciled. In fact, that reminds me of another paper by Danny Roderick, which has the title, if, is, uh, is global, uh, global equality uh, uh, the enemy of uh, national uh, equality? Uh, so th precisely uh, this, this, this topic. So the policies need to rise to the challenge. To, to, to address that, to reconcile that. And, and the rise in inequality in the national domain is important uh, because uh, that is the domain for, uh, for a large part of policy making. 
And, and, and that, in large part, is the domain for democratic expression. Uh, so, but I think the, the, my uh, bottom line message on this is, 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 is positive, that uh, there, is, there is scope for policies to reconcile uh, the two uh, uh, equality dynamics that we see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've made the first circle, and now let us uh, take the questions from the left. Thank you very much. I would like to thank to all the speakers. I just uh, couldn't leave this panel. Uh, my name is Vladimir Beruk. I'm the director of the Institute of uh, Education Development from Belarus, Minsk. I've been working in Russia for 40 years. I've been studying the Russian-American relationships for 30 years. And uh, my purpose is to correspond uh, the ideas for countries like Belarus, those that are satellites to the Economic Union and other unions. Your question, please. In the future of geopolitics, how the countries that where policies take either one vector or multi vector development concept, how the society can understand its purposes because because not only politicians but population the society as well is responsible for the legacy what we can choose as as uh, main uh, points of interest well for you of course for belarus uh, the main point of interest is uh, the state union I'm sorry it's a joke uh, well, what are the priorities, you mean, um, for the society? Uh, who, who would you like to address this question to? To Mr. Kartunov? Because he's keeping, keeping silent. Well, if this is a question to me, I would first like to criticize the such term as satellite. In our discourse, very often we mention the privileged sphere of Russian interests, the neighboring countries. Well, could you please tell me, do you think that Mr. Lukashenko is a, a muppet of Mr. Putin? If we look at the character of relationships between our two countries, if we look at the level of independency of uh, the Belarusian foreign, foreign policy, I think this idea will not be proved. Belarus has its own foreign policy. It is, uh, well, autonomous, uh, it is balanced. It is uh, rather fine in term, in the way it balances its relationships with Russia and other neighbors uh, in the European context. So I would not like to uh, uh, choose as derogatory term as satellite. Belarus is not a satellite of the Russian Federation. Speaking about the future world order, and in fact, we've spoke about that already it should be more dem democratic it means that it will provide more points of entrance for to democracy and uh, countries may take uh, middle middle level uh, posi positions uh, competing with the leader so uh, for belarus i think uh, these positions may be less strict than those of cold war or uh, the end of the 19th century. Speaking about the role of uh, NPOs, uh, NGOs, here the main aspect is the decision-making process inside specific countries. Both in Belarus and in Russia, the foreign policy, to my point of view, is over-centralized. We lack professional discourse very often we lack feedback. We have no feedback, and this prevents from societies having an opportunity to influence the most important decisions being taken. But 
even in our environment, we have these possibilities, and our task is to find them and use them. And our task is to operate in terms of the limitations that uh, we see today. Thank you very much. The last row, we will take three more questions. Uh, and uh, thus, we will cover the left part, central part, and right part, and there we will finish. I work for the United Nations Global Compact. My question is to Richard Haas, um, forward-looking. The, um, the concept that you um, described, I found a very interesting sovereignty plus areas where states have an obligation to act that could do harm to other states. I want to ask you, who would be the body or the bodies to decide these areas? And what areas do you already foresee would fall into that space? I would say you would say, buy my book. I can promise you I just bought it. So, But maybe you can explain a little bit further. But I just thought, I mean, you, you talked about your book, so it's probably in, in there. So I bought it just now. But just maybe you can explain it even a little bit further. No, 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 no. We, we answer one by one. Because, uh, okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you also for buying the book. Uh, look, this can't be imposed. My view is that the ideas that ought to shape or inform what I call World Order 2.0 need to grow out of consultations. Uh, and some of these consultations have been taking place for some time. Uh, in cyber, though, for example, the consultations are quite primitive. What behaviors ought to be uh, encouraged? What behaviors ought to be discouraged? What ought to be the penalties if and when certain types of behaviors uh, take place all the same? What sort of regulatory body needs to be constructed? Uh, in global health, we have what's called the international health regulations. The problem is that many countries are not living up to them. What then should be done? Uh, are there sanctions that ought to be introduced? Uh, in climate change, we have the Paris Agreement. This is an area of sovereign obligation. Now, what's so interesting about the Paris Agreement is every country sets its own obligations. That's the, the character of the agreement. The question will come if and when, as, as, I think it's a question of when, those, the obligations they are setting are inadequate. What then? So I think in every case there has to be some kind of a consensus. It will not be universal. I think what you will have in many areas are like-minded countries beginning to act together. It might be a group of six, a group of 10, a group of 12 or 15 or 20, what have you. They will set up their own network and others will hopefully come to realize the benefits of, of agreeing to those same obligations and joining it. In some ways, that's the concept of the TPP in the trade area. We're out now 11, unfortunately, not 12 countries will, will set up a, a framework to, to, to deal with that. But I think that's, that's the way this will work. This will take decades. It will not be the same in each functional area. It'll be different in trade than it is in health, than it is in proliferation, than it is in cyber. You may have different countries, and also not just countries. You can't have a conversation about health without the Gates Foundation and without the big pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so it's going to be very uneven. And we're going to have to tackle issues about what to do when countries don't meet what we believe are their obligations. We've already seen it to some extent. After Afghanistan did not meet the obligation to make sure its territory wasn't used for terrorism, the United States used military force, and most of the world supported it. Uh, that was not, I think we're going to have an interesting test case with North Korea. What happens if North Korea does not meet obligations about nonproliferation, even though I understand it's not a party to the nonproliferation treaty? What then? So we have test cases all the time. But it will not be a single negotiation. We're not going to, this is not the Congress of Vienna. There will not be one negotiation. There will not be one universal compact. What we're going to see is in each functional area a separate set of conversations or consultations. The result may be formal, informal, somewhere in between. You'll have different memberships in each area. But I think over time, 
this will be the, the direction of international relations. Thank you very much, Igor Yurevich. Sergei Tsipleyev, uh, the Northwestern Division of uh, Vranipa. Any autocritarian and uh, despot ha wants to have a free hand uh, in the world, and that is why they claim to be liberal, be that head of state or be that uh, one of the regional leaders. My question is to Andrei Kartonov. Uh, do you have a question about uh, Mr. Poltavchenko? Right, uh, about that as well. I have a question to Andrei Kortunov. You said that uh, one pole world has failed. Uh, we seem to have uh, a lot of poles, uh, the US, Europe, China, India. Why it didn't work? How many poles uh, do you think will do? And uh, is it true that uh, we will not uh, be, we will not agree to uh, a multi-pole model if uh, we're in one of, just one of the poles. Well, thank you. I think that uh, the difference between the situation of today and the situation after the, Napoleon, the Napoleon's wars is that in Europe uh, there were several empires. They were different, but they had equal weights. They were changing coalitions and uh, they were balancing and rebalancing configuration of their powers and resources. But they uh, did not survive after the Germany grew stronger and made an alliance and uh, that is what it did not survive. Right now these centers do not have equal weights. The centers that well, luckily or unfortunately, they cannot work together equally. In the same way, it is difficult to see how they may be changed and reshaped and uh, that it is uh, difficult to see how uh, Russia can work together with the US, for example, so we do not see the transformation, reconfiguration process that uh, may be happening in the future. We've mentioned already that the system is very complicated and uh, it is impossible for several centers to control the situation. So a multipole world, it is very romantic, uh, and uh, this is, but this is a nostalgic romanticism. It, it is uh, Better to speak about a polar world, uh, the world with uh, a number of players. But when here we speak about a multi-pole, multi-centered world, I think uh, we actually understand a bipolar world, West against the others. Thank you very much. The last question. Room number one. On the left. I'm from Center for Strategic Research. Thank you for a wonderful panel. Uh, I have two questions. First, question to Richard Haas. Uh, you were talking about two operating systems, and I quite agree that they actually there actually may be two operating systems, and uh, I quite agree with Mr. Training that uh, they operate at the same time, but. Well, as many of us know, when you try to work on a computer with two operating systems uh, working at the same time, it uh, leads actually to system failure. Uh, so uh, how about we need to, to, to solve for global problems more? You, 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 you spoke about that. And at the same time, we have under this operating system 1.0, we have sanctions, for instance. How do you resolve this conflict? Uh, between two operating systems. And my second question is for Ivan Krastev. Um, where we talk a lot about uh, clashes and conflicts between nations, but we talk very little about conflicts and polarization within nations. I mean, we can see that in the United States, a great, a huge polarization between New Yorkers and, say, Alabamans. We see the same in Russia, in China, in India, in European countries, so 
uh, we, un we understand that the identity of cities is quite different from the identities of uh, well regions of small villages and so on. And we know that 60% of the global population would soon live in uh, global cities. So this clash, how, how do we um, um, speak about this conflict uh, um, about when we speak about designing new globalization? Thank you. Richard. I don't think the analogy to a, a computer trying to work on two operating systems at the same time works here. So rather than thinking of these as two operating systems that are fundamentally different, I would say as they are complementary or supplementary. One is foundational. My argument is that respect for sovereignty is, uh, to use the social science language, is, is necessary but not sufficient. It is the basis of world order. If we don't have respect for sovereignty, then we go back to where we were at the worst moments in the last few hundred years. So it's necessary. My point is simply, it's no longer adequate. It's no longer sufficient in a global world where we have other challenges to our well-being in addition to countries invading other countries. So what we need to do is have an enhanced or an expanded notion of what we need, uh, what needs to come about in order to provide order for states. So yes, at a minimum, respect for sovereignty. But in addition now, we need to have an understanding that we all have to accept obligations to make sure that things do not develop within our own territory that would pose a threat to the well-being, the security, or the prosperity of uh, others. So again, I don't see them in, in competition. Uh, I see them as complementary. The issue of sanctions is already an issue, which is uh, how is it you sanction a country because of their behavior in one domain? At the same time, you want to still cooperate or encourage behavior from that country in another domain. And that's a complicated issue. And I would simply say it's an argument for keeping sanctions focused as much as you can to keep them them narrow rather than broad. And it's also an argument for not becoming overly reliant on sanctions as the foreign policy tool of choice. And I think too often we, we decide that we don't want to sit on our hands and do nothing. We don't want to go war to war, so sanctions become the, the middle choice. They become option three. And as a result, they get used a great deal. So, sometimes effectively, but in many cases, they have uh, consequences or side effects that may not be uh, desirable. So I just think we need to show great discipline uh, with them. And it's a real challenge, I would argue, for U.S.-Russian relations. We obviously have major problems with what Russia did in Crimea, what it's doing in eastern Ukraine. Uh, most Americans have real difficulty uh, with what Russia did in interfering in our uh, political processes and so forth. Uh, we have real difficulty with the way Russia used force in Syria. At the same time, we want Russian cooperation vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea. We want to maintain the arms control uh, agreements between us. So managing that kind of a complex relationship is, shall we say, no easy, is, is no easy uh, task. And we need to make sure that when we introduce sanctions, they are sufficiently focused so they penalize for behavior in some areas, but do not preclude cooperation in other areas. Ivan. Thank you very much for your question. And I, I find it really important. Uh, in the first day of our discussion, Stephen Kotkin, who is here, made an example which uh, I do believe is great. He said, when 50 years ago the city of New York has been booming, all the areas around New York have been booming. And the same for Chicago and so on. Now, basically, when the city of New York is booming, it does not mean that basically the around places are going to boom. So in a certain way, you have a city that does not have a hinterland anymore. Why I'm saying this? Because in a certain way, the biggest problem with globalization, and particularly globalization, which is centered on the market, is that market like the internet <coughs> enforces people to follow their natural choices. And their natural choice is to go with people like them, to do things that they like. As a result of it, you have a huge fragmentation, not simply on the level of the international order, 
but you have a huge, huge fragmentation on the level of the nation state. Because the state was the mixer. The state was interested in a social cohesion. The state believed the social cohesion is the source of its power and legitimacy. But when you have a market-centered development, this is not the case anymore. And politically, if you basically see the electoral map of the United States after these elections, and if you ask some Carl Schmitt to tell you what this is about, he's going to see is that America basically is divided between sea powers and land powers. You have a major, basically, urban areas in which the majority of the population lives, but which basically does not control territory. From this point of view, they do not control the political process. Uh, and I find this, it's not only America, it's everywhere. This fragmentation in Europe led to the fact there was a, a, a British sociologist, David Goodhart, who said that the major divide today is not between left and right, but between people from somewhere and people from anywhere. So this is an identity politics. And uh, I, I, I do believe that this is quite important because as a result of it, these two groups have a different rationale of political behavior. Some people has roots and other people has legs. People with legs, when they want uh, basically to change something, they exit. They basically change places. They don't have time to change governments. And this is one of the reasons why people became so mistrustful to the elites. It is the mobility of the elites more than anything else that in Europe makes people so mistrustful. Because they said, when the bad times come, they will leave. They will not stay with us. Uh, and I find this quite important because from this point of view, in order to have this system of 2.0, uh, uh, you need a level of cohesion of the states. It's not enough, basically, that you have a state actors and non-state actors. The biggest problem is that you have states that do not control any more their own societies. And from this point of view, and this is my last point, I do believe that internal instability of states be it democracies or authoritarian regimes, now are the major risks for interna international order much more than the competition between the states. Because if in the traditional politics of the 19th century, states have been mobilizing domestic resources in order to expand outside, now they're mobilizing global resources in order to stabilize at home. Thank you very much. Allow me on the rights of the moderator to share with you five short observations, maybe six, about what I uh, brought out of this discussion, which I consider as phenomenal, deep and interesting. First, exponential development of technology, finance, trade, uh, exhausting of natural resources and uh, growth of population lead us to the increase of uh, the role of global institutes and universalism. Just on definition. Second interesting thought that in this uh, system, whether we democrat or autocrats, technologies bring us closer. And big data, the big data we operate, uh, they uh, lead to super centralization in China, to decentralization in other countries, but the level of knowledge in all the places influence the governance system both domestically and globally. And in this regard, autocrats and uh, totalitarians come closer to democrats from the point of view of the global governance. The sovereignty is supplemented with global uh, obligations and Richard Haas told us very interesting things about it today and he wrote a lot about it uh, in your book. Richard, I'm not your agent, but uh, I'd like to advertise your book a little bit. A global, a global governance starts with good uh, internal reforms and internal governance. A institution of global governance to exist, European Union, G20, many other traditional bodies, but they require continuous updating, continuous refreshment, and they will become global only if we will deal with this process altogether. Governmental, non-governmental actors, students, experts, and uh, scholars. And my final uh, wish and uh, huge gratitude to Mr. Kartonov and the authors of the paper, uh, such papers 
bring huge contribution to the uh, in local policy of Russia. And this paper is really useful for that. Many thanks to our panelists, and uh, let's uh, uh, support them with your applause, please.